it's not Gatorade this time, but it's not tea. It's coffee. <laughs> Black coffee that I'm hoping will be sweetened with like one spoonful of sugar. Not sweetened enough. A couple of things. Thing one, this video is mainly for my fellow Bridgerton watchers. Usually I try to contextualize my content for the uncultured, but today I'm just gonna be throwing opinions at you and you're gonna be expected to know what I'm on about. If two eight episode seasons of television is a lot of prerequisite viewing to ask, I do think my video about the book series will suffice. Speaking of, thing two, because my overall take on the show hasn't changed since we last talked Bridgerton, I wasn't sure I'd be covering the second season on this platform. I mean, I knew I'd be tweeting about it, but it was upon tweeting about it as obsessively as I've been that I accepted my fate. The material is clearly here, the people are incessantly asking for it, and therefore this is my lot in life. Make no mistake though, thing three, this is not a review. A review is what would have me repeating myself. I'm more interested this time around in exploring the response to season two. Don't get me wrong, you won't leave here today without an understanding of my thoughts on it, but the thoughts of others are the issue at hand. You see, there are plenty of totally valid criticisms to have of either season, but I consider the most prominent critiques online right now to be grossly dishonest. Even when they aren't objectively false, I find myself in vehement subjective disagreement. As depicted by this diagram made by me and for my amusement, if the x-axis denotes correctness about Bridgerton and the y-axis denotes loudness about Bridgerton, I'm loud and right, you're loud and wrong, unless you agree with me, and everyone else is happy. I jest. But I'm legitimately developing a bit of a complex. I've referred to myself as a Bridgerton opinion having elitist, and maybe that was bound to happen. My last video about it is one of my personal favorites. It did better numbers than I typically see, and its comment section is my most complimentary by far. As if that weren't enough validation, a couple of days after season two dropped, I was briefly featured on the Tamron Hall show divulging my first impressions. Me. A daytime television approved Bridgerton opinion haver. I'd show you what I said, but I was talking over myself. It's me! The point is, I'm in the abnormal position of being a fan of something that people will actually want to hear me talk about, which is one reason why I might have an inflated sense of justification. Another, I think, is more universal. Everybody who cares about art and media has at least one thing surrounded by messy discourse that they kind of wish they were the only one allowed to talk about. Bridgerton is that girl for me, which is complicated by the fact that she appears to be that girl for everyone else, hence the confusion. Guys, it's me. I'm the one allowed to talk about it. Still kidding. I hope that's obvious. The real reason I've decided to bring up my willingness to die on the Bridgerton battlefield is because I think it informs why I've gone about this how I have. In each chapter of this video, I'll more or less be defending the show against what are, in my opinion, often unfair criticisms. Critiques of my own will be sprinkled throughout, and because I run the risk of assuming my own correctness, I'll take extra care to really heed the points of view I'm countering. All that and more after the break. Today's video is brought to you by Green Chef, a CCOF certified organic meal kit company which delivers step-by-step -step recipes and pre-measured ingredients right to your door. Before working with them, I'd never tried Green Chef despite considering it often, but let me tell you, I'm sold. My life will never be the same. It's not as if I was unaware that the reasons casually cooking beyond the basics can feel so impossible include the time and energy spent sifting through online recipes, grocery shopping, and prepping, but I didn't realize until all of that was done for me how much of a load off it is. All of the meals they sent me were delicious and nutritious with accurate 30 minute cook times from the vegetarian menu. Little known fact, I've been an herbivore for five years, but Green Chef has meal plans for all sorts of other diets and lifestyles as well. Vegan, Mediterranean, fast and fit, keto, paleo, gluten-free. If, like I was, you've been on the fence, Definitely try it out at least once because with my code, all caps, Julia Cudney130, you can get $130 off. Click the link in my description or go to greenchef.com for details. <laughs> 
The first thing you need to understand is that I was busy editing my Gossip Girl video the day season 2 dropped, so initial reactions graced my timeline and for you page before I got around to it myself. Full disclosure, by the way, my knowledge of the discourse is limited to that of Twitter and TikTok because those are the spaces where I prefer being chronically online. I couldn't tell you what the Reddit or Tumblr girlies are saying. I don't even know if they do fandom on Instagram outside of edits. Now, the majority of those reactions were positive. I saw a lot of well-deserved love for Kate and Anthony. One of my followers let me know that the season appeared to them to have been in response to my last video, which I don't believe to be true, but it was exciting to hear nonetheless. I do think we're on the same page a lot of the time, me in the writer's room. There was, however, an unhappy undercurrent. For one, I kept hearing about deviations from the source material, but we're saving that conversation for the next chapter. What concerns us at the moment are complaints of an overprevalence of subplots, which I've been skeptical of from the beginning. As far as I know, the first sign that people were going to be making a problem out of any screen time allotted to side characters, especially those of the female variety, was an unwelcoming response to Edwina's inclusion in this promotional poster. I mean, people were going as far as to edit her out, but what do you know? The reason their solo poster hadn't been unveiled yet is because it was set to be the book cover. Such complaints started out small misunderstandings like that, but they seemed to have snowballed. People went from simply expressing disinterest in the scenes absent of Kate or Antony to insisting Chris Van Dusen and Shonda Rhimes had sought out to maliciously sideline them. An entire campaign for the release of their many alleged deleted scenes has emerged. To be fair, there is evidence to suggest some Cantony footage hit the cutting room floor, but not an egregious amount by any stretch of the imagination. As confirmed by Chris Van Dusen, an entirely normal amount. Anybody who knows anything about post-production would tell you that trimming the edges is par for the course. What I find most annoying about all of this backlash is that it's based in the verifiably false premise that Kate and Antony were less present in their season than Simon and Daphne were theirs. I say verifiably false because we have access to the timestamp Stamps, and people are throwing out fishy numbers. Just did a time analysis of Bridgerton season 2 and added up the Cantony screen time versus total minutes of Bridgerton in season 2. Cantony, in a season about them, got 108 minutes and 32 seconds. There were a total of 504 minutes in season 2. Unacceptable. Season 3 better make up for this lost time with Cantony. Oh my god, so you're telling me y'all only filmed 33 minutes of the main couple in an 8 hour series? Well, ma'am, I'm sorry, but I don't believe you. The Bridgerton season two premiere was titled Capital R Rake, and the rake in question got five minutes of screen time because of the Lady Whistledown plot. Cantony only got 15 minutes of screen time in a 70 minute season finale because of the Featherington slash pollen hugging up all of the screen time. Naturally, upon doubting the arithmetic of my peers, I've spent April diligently accounting for every second apart from opening logos and closing credits of both seasons by category via a spreadsheet which I've linked a PDF version of in the description like a good student who shows her work. It's genuinely a coincidence that both of my Bridgerton videos have involved spreadsheets, but if I end up making one about season three you're gonna have to help me come up with something. Anyway, I don't want to divulge all of my intel right away. I'd rather take an iceberg approach. The tip of said iceberg and the simplest statistic that I need to get across is that season two is longer than season one. Full stop. I did my calculating two by two, which is to say that I started with season one, episode one, skipped forward to season two, episode one, back for season one, episode two, and so on. Doing it this way left the question of which season would turn out longer unanswered until the bitter end. The first was a consistent 50 something minutes an episode, while the second fluctuated wildly back and forth between 40 and 60. They were like the tortoise and the hare in that way. I thought they'd finish in a near tie, but the hare took it in the end. It's precisely 16 minutes and 35 seconds longer than the tortoise. I'll drop this analogy. It was fun while it lasted. Bear in mind, the shortest episode the entire series has to offer is 49 minutes and 31 seconds. 16 minutes and 35 seconds is 33.49% of that, which is like a third of an episode. 
season two has a third of an episode over season one. I've been running numbers, it's true. It might not sound like a lot, and in the grand scheme of things, it isn't, but those 16 minutes are what ensured Antony's season beat out Daphne's for total screen time dedicated to both subplot and main plot. That's right, according to my interpretation of what differentiates subplot and main plot of Bridgerton, the second season has three extra minutes of subplot and 13 extra minutes of main plot. Funny how when there's more screen time to go around, more goes around. Honestly, I'd like to rest my case there, but if I were dying on the hill that Cantony was sidelined, you know what I would say? Yeah, whatever, Julia, we're not talking about cumulative screen time, we're talking about percentage of screen time, and that would be fair. There's more to the story. Allow me to introduce you to the categories I sorted my timestamps into, beginning with these three. Focal romance, focal overflow, and focal storyline. Thing one, they're color-coded like this because the prior two must add up to the third. Thing two, these were originally called leads together, leads apart, and leads overall, which is still the easiest way to understand them. I didn't leave their titles alone for two reasons, one of which I'll inform you of soon, and the second of which being scenes about the leads without their presence. By this I don't mean any mention of their name ever, but specifically when the needle is moved forward in their storyline. I cannot stress enough how few and far between these scenes were. Think Lady D and Violet plotting to set up Simon and Daphne, or Daphne confirming Violet's suspicions that Kate and Antony are like in love. These went into focal overflow, which is altogether a category more confusing than focal romance. Are the lovebirds fighting? Kissing? Staring longingly? Sniffing? That's the main event, meaning focal overflow is like everything else they do. Antony's scenes with Edwina, Daphne's with the prince, Kate's scenes with Edwina, and Daphne's with Antony. I think people who consider Edwina to have taken up enough space to rival Kate as a female lead are failing to consider how many roles she took on comparative to season one. She's still decidedly a side character. To be clear, this doesn't mean that every scene of Edwina's went into focal overflow, only the vast majority of them because while Kate and Antony have plenty of scenes absent of her, and they should, she doesn't have any absent of them. I can only remember three off the top of my head. She told Penelope she liked her dress, that was cute. She played cards while the leads were off hunting, and my personal favorite, she placated the king in a time of need. I considered all of that subplot. Little side note, over with, more on Edwina later. For now, I hope you have an understanding of the first three categories because we are moving on to the last three, which are subplot, leads and subplot, and the Featheringtons. Obviously, the focal storyline and subplots add up to the total runtime of any given episode, but the other two categories are entities of their own. Potential involvement of the leads in subplots would be the other reason why I didn't leave focal overflow as leads apart. I had this theory that the participation of Simon and Daphne in the subplots of their season outweighed Kate and Antony's in theirs, and that if that were true, that could account for part of why people thought the screen time disparity was worse than it was if I was correct that it wasn't as bad as people said. You'll find out whether this theory proved true, but no, this was the most exclusive category. A lead had to go out of their way to meddle in someone else's business to wind up here. As such, it really didn't become relevant until the back end of season one when Simon and Daphne go on little side quests, but to be precise, if I ever caught them talking about someone else's problems secretly thinking of their own, I moved them right back into focal overflow. Why should he be the one to choose your future when he clearly cares not for the outcome? Rest assured, I was picky. Anyway, my curiosity regarding the screen time of the Featherington household was brought about by what we've seen of people blaming them for sucking up all of the minutes. Included in the category is literally anything featuring anyone who currently lives in the Featherington household, which means Marina in season one, but not in season two, all of Penelope's scenes acting as Lady Whistledown, chatting with Eloise, or otherwise. Now, remember that you can access the detailed PDF 
but we are going to go over the big numbers. According to my calculations, approximately 1% more screen time was dedicated to the focal storyline of season two. Likewise, 1% more screen time was dedicated to the subplots of season one. I'm being so serious. I fear that the striking similarity between these numbers will have you under the impression that I worked backwards from them. But as established, I did this thing chronologically. There were times after a season one episode was particularly heavy on the romance that I thought I would have to sit here, swallow my pride, and admit that I was loud and wrong all along. I'm relieved not to be in that position, but I would have done it. I swear by these numbers. You might, however, be wondering why I left out the wings. What about all of that other stuff? Did you think we forgot about all of that other stuff? No, but I do think the more specific categories are better suited to this next bit in which I'd like to explore why so many people came to the same faulty conclusion. It would be easy to show off my hard-earned statistics and to move along, but I did promise to attempt heeding the points of views I would be arguing against, and I refuse to believe everyone's lying on purpose. First of all, my spreadsheet isn't infallible. I do believe it's the most honest assessment of screen time floating around right now, but there were times when I didn't know where to put these or those 10 seconds. I do believe that if you did it all yourself, you would find areas to disagree with me. Second of all, if I were dying on the hill that Cantony was sidelined, I'd have a few critiques of my little system. For instance, that leads in subplots category is suspiciously beneficial to my point. I can definitely see an argument in favor of absorbing it into focal overflow because any screen time that Simon and Daphne have that Antony and Kate don't should count as disparity. I stand behind including it because I do consider it in a league of its own, but let's explore this absorption. If we move 3.6% from the subplots of season one to the focal storyline, as well as move 0.41% from the subplots of season two to the focal storyline, season one does take over as being heavier on the leads by 2.28%. That may be too small a difference to effectively debunk my overall findings, but I do think that measly amount of screen time contributed to the feeling that season two was more subplotty. The first season, however briefly, went out of its way to draw parallels between subplot and main plot to tie everything together. Like they had Daphne help a pregnant woman find her absentee baby daddy while she might have been pregnant with a child fathered by a man who'd want nothing to do with it. That would be a more meaningful similarity if Daphne didn't try to conceive against Simon's will, but I digress. They also had Simon bear witness to the boxer's dedication to his family while he was struggling with his conviction not to start his own. Season two didn't bother with through lines like that. Kate and Antony came out none the wiser about what was going on around them. I don't even think they met the new Lord Featherington. Speaking of the Featheringtons, a possibility that immediately comes to mind when you stop to consider why people got the impression that season two had more subplots than season one is that maybe the opposite is true? What if the designated subplot screen time was split between fewer of them, which made those few appear overbearing? If that were the case, based on the popular accusation that the Featheringtons monopolized season two, I would expect them to take up the vast majority of the 43% of it dedicated to subplots. It turns out they're only responsible for like half of it and they were only featured about 2% more than in season one. Even if you want to make the case that I shouldn't have accounted for Marina within the Featheringtons category, the majority of her scenes in season one were with Penelope and or the Baroness, so they would have still counted. It's more likely that what's going on is that you simply liked Marina better than Prudence, that you preferred Penelope before she was Lady Whistledown, and that you didn't think the forgettable Lord Featherington was somebody who needed a replacement. I'm in the same boat, believe it or not. I've told everyone who's asked me if my favorite season is one or two that I prefer the subplots of season one, but the main romance of season two. It's a popular opinion to have as far as I know, but 
we can just say that. We don't have to lie. We don't have to make stuff up. If there is truth to the notion that Antony and Kate were treated differently than Simon and Daphne, it's found within the subsections of Focal Overflow, which I'm sure you've been curious about. I found season one to be like 4% heavier on the leads together. If I had to guess what pushed them over the edge, it would be all of the sex, which there is much more of. We are still dealing with a relatively small percentage, but it is the biggest difference I found, and it's not nothing. It seems worse, actually, if you don't look at it as a percentage and instead focus in on totality of romantic screen time. Cantony has exactly 15 minutes and 43 seconds less of such footage to their name. That number fascinates me because it's pretty near to the 16 minutes and 35 seconds their season has over the other. There's a way of looking at it like all of that extra time was poured into focal overflow, and I'm willing to bet that most people would ask for more sex scenes over the worst of that category. I will point out, however, that Focal Overflow isn't just full of a bunch of boring garbage that nobody wanted to see. There's some well-appreciated stuff in there. Still, if you want to argue that Kate and Antony were robbed of 15 prime kissin' minutes, that's your prerogative. Have fun. The only remaining argument I can muster against myself in all of this is that maybe not everybody is implying comparison to season one. Perhaps some people think both couples were wronged and that both seasons spared too much time for other people. If that's the case, fine, but I don't think you like this show. You should check out or stick to the incredibly narrow-minded and insular book series. From the beginning, its adaptation was conceived as a program bigger than the Bridgertons, and I think it's all the better for it. My worst fear moving forward is that the writing room listens to fans asking them not to dare improving upon the books, to neglect any character that isn't on the verge of kissing a Bridgerton, and to refrain from introducing any new characters, lest they behave as more than mere set pieces in service of romance. Sounds terrible. You guys would make the worst showrunners. Before we finally move on from the screen time part. There is a kind of related criticism that I'm noticing a lot more recently. This is that Kate, independent of Antony, is not offered an adequate amount of emotional content or character development. By this, people usually mean that Simone didn't have a lot of Emmy bait monologues to work with or flashbacks like Simon or Antony had. No, by the way, Daphne didn't have flashbacks either, but unlike Kate, Daphne didn't have trauma in the books that was done away with. I'm actually inclined to agree with this criticism. I don't really miss Kate's specific trauma from the book because it's too similar to Antony's and they're already incredibly similar characters, but I do think in removing it, they needed to replace it with something. A lot of Kate's screen time separate from Antony is less meaningful than his screen time separate from her, often logistical. But this is where my take differs, I think, because here I am comparing Simone's content to Jonathan's, while I'm apparently meant to be comparing her almost exclusively to the other female cast members. After much consideration, I've come to the conclusion that I strongly resent this framing of the critique. Weighty character material is unlike screen time in that there isn't a finite amount of it to go around, and we seem perfectly able to comprehend that concept in regards to the Bridgerton brothers, whose arcs are never called into question, as they shouldn't be. If it's true that Kate deserved more, it's the fault of her existing screen time being misused and mishandled. Comparisons to other characters can really only serve to point out what's missing, which makes me think the only apt comparisons are to Daphne as a female lead, Simon as a non-Bridgerton lead, and Antony as a lead of season two. If I had found in my screen time analysis that the subplots of season two really did outsell the main plot, I might flag an overprevalence of Eloise or Penelope as being unfair or even microaggressive because they're white women while Kate isn't. But that imbalance doesn't exist. Perhaps an imbalance does exist in the substantiality of the stuff Eloise and Penelope got versus Kate, 
but I don't think that's what people are picking up on based on how much of the brunt of the backlash Edwina is bearing. I might not have formally accounted for how much of Kate's focal overflow screen time also featured Edwina, but as I've implied, I don't think it's realistic to suggest she commanded more attention than the Prince and Antony did combined in season one. Sure, the sixth episode was a big one for her involvement, just like the fourth episode of season one was a big episode episode for Antony's involvement. Not everybody liked him back then, and you don't have to like Edwina, but nobody suggested he was overstaying his welcome. When the show's official Twitter account tweeted about him, they weren't met with a bunch of replies saying, we don't care, less of him please. To clarify, that particular element is also the result of a perceived inequality between the promotion of Simone and Charithra. I very nearly rounded up all of the press to get to the bottom of it, but I decided that would be too much work, and I realized it would be playing into a hand that I don't want to be. It's my belief that we shouldn't be nickel and diming the successes of these women to begin with. You will never convince me that banding together in protest against promotion of Charithra is an appropriate defense of Simone regardless. They're both representative of South Asian women, they're both having moments in the sun right now, and I don't think either of them would appreciate the other being resented for taking up space. It's not as if imposing a narrative of a victimization upon Simone is helpful to her anyway. Now she can't be appreciated without some people calling it disingenuous. Here's hoping the next two parts are shorter. <laughs> I've been marinating on this one a lot. <laughs> to defending adaptation. I'm a perpetual opposer of the popularly held belief that books are always better because I think people often forego meaningful comparison of entertainment value, theme, or whatever else in favor of playing spot the difference and patting themselves on the back for finding them. Clearly, this isn't the first time I've thought about this. I consider it one of my most fervently held opinions. I've mentioned potentially making a video about it. The reason I haven't is because I worry it wouldn't amount to much besides listing examples of adaptations I love, adaptations I hate, and adaptations I have mixed feelings about. In this theoretical video, I think my best argument in favor of the idea that adaptations have the capacity to actively improve upon their source material would be the Bridgerton franchise. I think both seasons of the show are better than their novels in almost every conceivable way. And it's not even like I despise the books. I read them all of my own volition. Most of you probably already have, but for more on my overall opinions of the novels, check out that first video. Today, the Viscount Who Loved Me gets the spotlight. While I'd originally bookmarked a bunch of tweets and TikToks about the show totally ruining it to argue against, I ultimately decided to leave most of them alone. I still have a few to show off, but I don't know. There's something straightforward about showing you a tweet that says Antony and Kate only got 33 minutes of screen time and saying It was all a lie! Guys, it was all a lie! She lied. Even with all of my stats in tow, I had to work through like a thousand caveats. You heard them. And now that we're moving into more subjective territory, I just don't think it's feasible to debate with everyone who's ever said anything negative about deviations from the source material. The discourse is too far gone to catch up with. People have been going back and forth about this for a month. Plus, the masses appear to have love for this book that I don't. If it bothered them to see it altered, that's their business. My favorite Bridgerton novel is The Seventh. Maybe if Hyacinth gets her season and she better, I will be the one saying the book is better. Right now, I feel most inclined to make an independent case in favor of the changes made, and you can do with that what you will. The best way to go about it, I think, is to go over my myriad of problems with the book and explain why I think the show fixed them. Those problems, in the order we'll be addressing them, include some serious issues 
of consent and overwhelming similarity to the Duke and I. And lastly, a failure to either effectively subvert or cash in on the tropes utilized. So borderline abuse is a series wide issue. I had a whole section of my original video about it, but I tried not to get into the nitty gritty details. This book is the one I remember being the most generous to in terms of omitting the worst of it. There's some really off putting stuff on the table. A lot of it I'd actually forgotten about before rereading. I want to share a couple of these excerpts with you because I want you to understand what a relief it is that season two sidestepped as much as it did, especially considering what season one didn't. Of course, I've seen some people arguing that everything I'm about to mention should have been included, but let's assume they're outliers. To begin, in chapter four, Antony attempts to murder Kate. <laughs> I'm not even being dramatic. It's played for comedy, but he goes for her throat and says, I am going to kill you. <laughs> I laugh because it sounds like something out of a cartoon. I don't know how they would have pulled that off live action without making Antony come off like a menace. That's the vibe I get from a lot of their behavior exhibited in the book, by the way. Hardly any of it would have translated well to screen, which I think is why so much of it is gone. The majority of it is gone. Take in chapter six, for example, when Antony discovers Kate hiding under his desk while he's hooking up with Sienna's equivalent, and then they start discreetly biting and kicking each other. These are just moments of comical physical altercation though. I mentioned issues of consent and those hit the ground running halfway through when the leads are made to marry. Yes, if you're unaware, in the book when Kate gets stung by the bee, Antony tries to suck the venom out very much against her will and their scene. He grappled with the bodice of her gown, pulling it down to better expose her wound. My lord, Kate shrieked, stop! He pinned her against the back of the bench, still holding her dress down, not low enough to expose her but certainly lower than decently allowed. Antony, she tried, she didn't know this man. He was crazed, frantic, and completely heedless of her protestations. Will you shut up? He hissed, and with trembling hands, he plucked the stinger from her skin. Antony, I'm fine, she insisted. You must, she gasped. One of his hands now rather indelicately cupped her entire breast. Antony, what are you doing? She grabbed at his hand, trying to remove it from her person, but his strength was beyond her. I cannot convey the relief that I felt when I realized Antony wasn't going to try to suck the venom out in the show. The way the scene did play out and ended up my favorite actually, I think it was done beautifully. And while disagreeing, I can understand wishing the leads still got married halfway through the season. I can't understand wishing it happened the way it did in the books. It's true that Simon and Daphne were also forced into a marriage, but not because one was caught assaulting the other. And yes, I do consider this scene assault. It's a moment that makes me unhappy with the depiction of Antony's trauma because it's utilized here to alleviate the discomfort the audience might feel at seeing him violate her while she protests profusely. The other may majorly dubious sequence of consent happens after their wedding. Kate asks Antony if they might wait a week before consummating their marriage and he berates her into compliance. I don't enjoy being condescended to, Kate said stiffly. His eyes flashed and I don't like my rights being denied, he returned, his voice cold and his face a harsh rendition of aristocratic power. I'm just asking for a reprieve. Surely you would not deny me such a simple request. Of the two of us, he said, I don't think I'm the one doing the denying. He was right and she had no idea what else to say. He had every right to toss her over his shoulder, drag her off to bed, and lock her in the room for a week if he so desired. These being the circumstances surrounding their marriage, I've been terribly confused as to why everyone's so upset they remained unwed until the last second of season two. I'm beginning to think you lot read an entirely different book than me. That or you've just fictionalized unfounded versions of its events in your head. Kate deserved her wedding. She deserved to celebrate her happiness and joy finding her soulmate. Antony deserved a wedding the way he wanted it to be. He deserved to marry the love of his life and in no amount of excuses will rectify this mess. Like, what am I missing here? This is their whole wedding as it is in the book. There's not even dialogue, it's just summarized. I feel like a crazy person. Whatever. While we're on the topic of their marriage, or lack thereof, it seems like everyone's in agreement that part of why 
Kate and Antony didn't get married in, say, episode five is because Simon and Daphne already did that. This similarity is not lost on everyone else, but I am beginning to take issue with it being considered the only possible reason why the writers might have deviated. I think too many people are only pointing out the repetitive nature of these obligatory engagements to suggest that a better version of Cantonese story was sacrificed to avoid that alikeness. I'm instead going to go out on a limb here and say that I think the change was for the better regardless. If I had to choose which couple got to keep their midpoint wedding, I would choose Simon and Daphne because while I have other problems with their story, pacing isn't one of them. Pacing, however, is one of my biggest problems with the Viscount who loved me. In my first video, I said something about it wasting the enemies to lovers trope by establishing them as total BFFs by chapter 12. And that's just when they fully admit to not hating each other. They're kissing by chapter 6. 6 says in the same chapter with the kicking and biting. It's weird to see season 2 receive so much praise for leaning into slow burn away from bodice ripping and backlash for doing away with all of the stuff that was necessary to make that happen. We can't really have it both ways and I'm on team slow burn. So one of the tropes I was referring to when I said the book failed to cash in on them was enemies to lovers. The other, and you're not gonna like this, is the love triangle. Look, if you're not familiar with this channel, you should know that I have a whole video in defense of love triangles because I don't think we're doing ourselves any favors by assuming they're inherently evil. Don't think for a second that when I say the book didn't deliver on the love triangle front that I mean it should have been a Team Edwina, Team Kate sort of scenario. Sounds nightmarish, actually. I only mean that the premise of a hero starting out pursuing the heroine's sister is a little too convoluted not to matter at all. The show made it matter. I've heard the introduction of conflict into Edwina and Kate's relationship called anti-feminist. There's a lot of framing it as them fighting over a man. I think if we should be calling anything anti-feminist, it should be the minimizing of their conflict as being over a man. It should be all of this lamenting the fact that Edwina wasn't the same one-dimensional character she was in the books who was pretty and liked to read. The way I see it, when novel Edwina happily proclaimed she knew Kate and Antony would wind up together all along, Julia Quinn wasn't meaningly subverting an expectation that they'd fight about it. She was falling into her tried and true habit of writing docile side characters. There's this popular piece of writing advice I love that says all of your secondary characters should think they're the main character because we all think we're the protagonist in our own heads. This is not a principle the Bridgerton series abides by. If a character isn't at present the lead, even if they'll become one later, their feelings don't run the risk of being hurt. Julia simply doesn't like to write platonic conflict. The worst offense is when Eloise finds out Penelope is Lady Whistledown. One, it's in the special epilogues because it didn't happen originally, and two, she doesn't care. And I've seen people protesting this change as well. Don't you see that this is better? That it's good actually for the characters to be invested in the story? I'm not even saying that I think the conflict between Edwina and Kate in the show was handled perfectly. I think they did go too far with the half-sister line. I think it would feel better resolved if Kate had a moment to vent her frustrations like Edwina did. I think the resolution of the entire series feels rushed, and a major part of that is Edwina's forgiveness being brought on by a horse crash. A horse crash. What I am saying is that flawed as it may be, I will always choose conflict and stakes over an absence of them. Fun fact about yours truly, 
I will always root for the plus size girly. It's my calling. As such, I am extremely invested in the character of Penelope Featherington, especially as one who is sure to, at some point, lead a wildly popular, inherently sexual, bodice-ripping romantic series like Bridgerton. It will be groundbreaking, I'm so excited, and I spend every waking moment worried that when it happens, everyone's gonna hate it. I've realized this month that I'm not able to simply mind my business and relish feeling represented by Penelope. I can't just dub her my favorite character and move on with my day because I want more for her season to be celebrated and successful than I even want to enjoy it. This means I keep tabs on popular opinion of pollen and it's not looking good. The hate for Colin is less vitriolic in nature. I don't remember people disliking him last year, and I think they can be pretty easily brought back into his corner. The writers just have to give him a few more save the cat moments or something. His haters fall into two main camps, those who find him boring and those who take issue with his actions. If you find him boring, I'd argue you're picking up on his internal conflict, which is all about feeling unspecial. That's why he compensates for personality with travel. I'm actually loving how they've explored that internal conflict thus far, because in the books, it's just an excuse for him to jealously lash out at Penelope. Those who take issue with his actions, I've seen point to his disparaging of Penelope behind her back and his visit to Marina. I did hate hearing him make fun of Penelope with his bros, but I do think the toxic masculinity of it all was a worthwhile deviation from the happenings of the books in which she overhears him saying much of the same, but without the implication that he's lying due to peer pressure. That being said, she also stands up for herself in the original version, and a lot of people are missing that. If she had cut in to confront him, it wouldn't be that different of a scene from Kate overhearing Antony engage in locker room talk. I still think they plan to have her address it with him later, which is more on brand for Penelope than making a show of it. The Marina stuff I think would have been better received if she also wanted closure. Like if she was pleased to see him and they had a nice forgiving chat. It's totally in character for the pragmatic Marina to be like, what are you even doing here? But the cost of that reaction is making Colin appear sort of pathetic and desperate. I just hope y'all are willing to give him three strikes. That's only two. And even if you can think of another, consider forgiving him one for helping the boxer and for my sake. The hate for Penelope is more complicated. She's a complicated character and part of me is ecstatic to see her take on a role unlike any other. And the other part of me, wishes I didn't have to take on a full-time job of being her defense attorney. There are, unfortunately, valid reasons to dislike her character. Some aren't, like expecting her to share her wealth with her emotionally abusive family, or calling her nothing but a brat with a gossip rag, but others are. If you've been following me on Twitter, you might have noticed all of my fears coming true about the writers escalating her wrongdoing as Lady Whistledown in service of drama. In my last Bridgerton video, one of the complaints I had about the books was that Lady Whistledown was up to less in them. Like in the show, she spills tea, but in the books, she's just a nosy opinion haver like me. It certainly makes her a less compelling plot driving force, but I'm starting to think the trade-off is maintaining Penelope's likability. We've seen her expose two of her closest friends now, and while I don't think her retractors do well enough to acknowledge the corners she was backed into, it is officially a pattern. She's officially a backstabber, and I can't have that. I'm getting stressed, especially because there's a theory going around that they're going to skip Benedict's season in favor of Collins. We were not left on an appropriate note for that. I think they should be working on repairing Penelope's friendship with Eloise, and I tweeted as much. Now, this tweet wound up giving me a new perspective. Reason being, there I was, as usual, bending over backwards to put myself in the shoes of a pollen hater. But the pollen haters who found me, 
did not put themselves in mine, someone to whom the success of the fat girl season is imperative. I won't be tuning into that Colin and Penelope's regardless. Making the two biggest losers in the show a couple will bring out so much hate in my heart. Two of the show biggest losers having a show is already something that would make me not root for them. You're not crazy, that one was definitely copying the last one. And poorly. They have no chemistry, OMG! I literally only watched to see Married Cantony IDGAF about that girl and her man who doesn't even like her. Now I wouldn't be able to handle a second season of them being made into a bigger plot and being a main story with the main ship. Just give them the main plot and get it over with because I want my booze season to be all about him and Sophie. Hopefully you can see why this was a turning point for me. Out of wishing the writers had done more to get people on her side and into realizing that at a certain point this isn't even a writing issue. It doesn't matter how she's written and it doesn't matter when. They're gonna hate her anyway. Don't feel like I'm leaving you on a bummer note. Really what this nail in the coffin did for me was set me free. It's okay that not everyone is going to love her because I'll do enough of it and no matter how many haters she accumulates, she's gonna get her man. I still sincerely hope public opinion shifts around them. But if it doesn't, and their season is announced to a bunch of replies saying, nobody moved, who cares? Remember that I told you so.